so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. From Mamma Mia, I'm Mia Friedman and you're listening to No Filter. If you were over the age of 15 in the 90s, like I was, you would have owned at least one Poppy King lipstick. Do you remember? It was decades before women would start businesses or niche makeup brands. There was nothing like Fenty or Charlotte Tilbury or Stiller. The only makeup brands were things like Revlon and L'Oreal and Longcom and Estee Lauder. But Poppy launched a range of seven matte lipsticks that were named after the seven deadly sins. They were absolutely incredible. It was 1991 and Poppy was just 19 years old. She was a Melbourne girl who saw a gap in the market for the kind of lipstick that she wanted to wear and she jumped into that gap. Poppy lipsticks were an instant hit. Conversations were started and friendships were sparked in nightclub bathrooms all over Australia As women like me applied our poppy lipsticks in the mirror and compared notes over our favourite shades, there'd been nothing like this in makeup or beauty before. My favourite shade was Avarice. Within just three years, Poppy King's business had grown to be one of the biggest cosmetic companies in Australia. And in 1995, she received the Young Australian of the Year Award. That year, the company made a profit of $6.5 million. A few years later, though, after a disagreement with her investors about the future direction of her company, Poppy shut it down. She moved to the US to work for cosmetics giant Estee Lauder, and she sort of disappeared. After that came the launch of another lipstick brand in the US called Lipstick Queen. Before she sold that, turned 40, and had a really long think about what she wanted to do with her career. Poppy has always been a leader not a follower, and she's always been a really original thinker and in a way that's not necessarily made it easy for her, which is what makes her next move so intriguing. Plus, she's dating again after the end of a long relationship with a much, much younger man. Strap in because Poppy King's back, baby. You've just been in Melbourne with a pop-up store. Yes. You're making a new lipstick in your Melbourne factory. You must be going down memory lane a lot, you know, harking back 30 years ago to when you started Poppy King with the range of the Seven Deadly Sins matte lipsticks. What was that time like? What are your memories of it now? Which are coming back, by the way. Yeah, the seven, all of them. All of the Seven Deadly <gasps> Sins are coming back. So look out for that because the, in the original formula, the original shades, I was sort of tempted to tweak it a little bit, you know. But no, I kept to the absolute real bona fide original Seven Deadly Sins. Coming so, full circle. Coming full circle. But I sort of feel like I could write some kind of rom-com adjacent film about sort of like waking up in 19, you know, 93 <laughs> You know, it felt really meaningful because of the manufacturing side. I think if I were just here doing this and selling American product back into Australia, I would have felt really strange about it. I would have felt quite disconnected. But because the manufacturing, which is really why I'm here, is to become an Australian exporter again. Why did you not come back before now? Because I've been pretty busy. (laughs) I've worked with so many corporations, either consulting or doing collaborations. I've done J. Crew, Kate Spade, Boots at number seven in the UK. I've worked with QVC, Target, Disney, The Gap. I mean, there's just. You started a whole other brand called Lipstick Queen. I started a whole other brand called Lipstick Queen that was sold here and had a huge hit with another lipstick that's coming back called Frog Prince. So the timing, I had just left Lipstick Queen and I was getting ready to, I think I was in touch with you quite a bit, getting ready to come back and do this in Australia and then COVID hit. Mm. And so I think when masks came in, think about it, everybody, even my closest friends, just kind of like when I say that, they go, oh, my God, I didn't think I didn't think about that either because, of course, we all started buying skincare. Yeah. Skincare went through the roof. Jewellery went through the roof because they were little things. But lipstick, because even then when we 
first we didn't leave our house, but then when we did leave our house, you didn't want to wear lipstick because it would get all over the mask. No. Did lipstick sales fall off a cliff? Totally. And also it just became something that was completely taboo. You had a civic duty to not show your lips when you're in public. You know, that was actually a civic duty and nowhere, you know, nowhere in my business plan could you sort of prepare for, well, what if suddenly lips are not allowed to be shown, (laughs) you know? Wow. So, you know, it was an extraordinary situation for everyone everyone. I think I heard the best quote about it. It kind of it was like we were all in the sea but in very different boats. You know, we were mm. all in the same sort of tumultuous sea with COVID but every one of us had our own particularly different vehicle that we were in it on, you know. And, and from- business aside, you personally were in New York, which was the epicentre of that really bad time, and you got COVID. I got COVID very early on. I was an early... Early adopter, <laughs> early, like all things. Like all things. I started helping very quickly an elderly neighbour who was in a walk-up with her shopping, you know, and she got COVID very early on. But I wasn't, you know, I was wearing gloves and all that. I mean, I really... This is Mar- like March 2020. This is March 2020. And then it's kind of funny slash sad but the first thing that went was my taste and smell when I think back to it because I'm not normally cooking for myself all the time I thought god I'm a bad cook you know <laughs> like I was just adding so much like it didn't <laughs> I, it just really didn't twig that kind of like maybe you've got like for until other symptoms started yeah. to show but I really thought because I was just your cooking because yeah. usually you eat out yeah because usually I'm eating out or reading yeah. pre-prepared or kind of like yeah. so I just really thought god I'm such a bad cook <laughs> everything's tasteless and I'm sort of <laughs> piling salt. the salt on <laughs> and then I got very very sick I was in emergency twice actually and you live alone I live alone so yes. who's your person I've got lots of people you know I go in and out of relationships as one does but certainly I'm very embedded with a garden that I've often talked about on my Instagram previous iterations, a community garden that's well, it's a sculpture garden near me. And all the people that are involved in that have become like family. And so when times get tough, I find mm. that those people, my neighbours, the people from the garden, my very good friends. Were they all checking in on you when they, you started to get sick or were you all checking in on each other? Because I imagine you have other friends who live alone. Yeah, we were all checking in on each other. But equally, I think we were just all in so much shock. Mm. You know, it was just such a shock to see the city shut down like that to see such an urban centre and then very quickly we had also the riots and George Floyd and defund the police and all the so it was just kind of one thing it was just like you know shell shock was just sort of one thing after another after another so I think everybody we were all checking in on each other Mm. but going through our own shock of what had happened to the city and a lot of people I knew who could get out of the city who had second homes you know would I wasn't in that position so I was very lucky and that I had made the decision years ago to kind of keep myself liquid financially, like rather than sort of invest in real estate or something like that in New York, that I had sort of kept a little bit of a in case of Investing. a rain yeah, in case yeah. of a rainy day, because sure did a rainy day come when I just had to stop and stopping earning in Manhattan as a single woman is a very difficult prospect. I made the right call in keeping liquid, otherwise I don't know how I would have got through that. You don't have an accent and yet you've lived there for 20 years. 21. 21 years. There have been certain inflection points where you could have come home. Yes. And you haven't. Yeah. Like when Lipstick Queen was sold, when you left that business, when you decided to leave that business after COVID, yep. perhaps when a lot of people were rethinking where they were going to be. Does Australia still feel like home to you or was there a point where New York became home? I very much feel like a dual citizen. You know, I mean, New York, the pace of New York, I feel naturalised to that, which is something that I would find very hard to adjust to. I mean, I always say that New York is like a giant mirror. You've been there and the days that you feel shit, it'll tell you you're shit, you know, to reflect that back. The days that you feel amazing, it will reflect that back, you know. So it's kind of that scale and that sense of possibility that sometimes doesn't feel great. It doesn't always feel great. I find it intimidating, energising, but really intimidating. Yes. I mean, yes, I don't have any accent because I, I really believe that. And if you listen to people like Nicole Kidman and Kate Blanchett and stuff like that talk when they're talking naturally they don't really have one either Mm, I think that once you go to America as an adult your dialect is pretty much I think people that come back with accents are kind of 
making that happen. I find that I really want to try to sort of like have more of a life in both hemispheres than I've been having. That's why I move my manufacturing here. When I'm here, I feel that this is my home. And when I'm in New York, I feel that New York's my home. And I think that that's kind of like something psychologically you need to do. But I do have friends in New York who sort of maintain much more of it. Mm. But I find that for me, it's a full-time job, New York, when I'm there. And it's a full-time job when I'm here. When you're a little girl and you imagined your grown-up life, did it look like this? In some ways it did because it was a fantasy, you know, kind of like, and I guess I've always had a childlike, some people may say childish, but I choose to say childlike imagination around what's possible. And so in some ways I wasn't born into a family that sort of had, you know, really sort of had a lot of structure or, you know, the milieu, my mother's friends were all artists and writers and stuff like that. So was it, it was the 70s. It was the 70s. It was quite bohemian yes, upbringing. very bohemian upbringing. And so Was I, your dad around? My dad died when I was seven. He was only 40, unfortunately, mm. from skin cancer, hence why I've been so pale. Mm. <laughs> and that was really when I first discovered the power of lipstick. Obviously, I've got a vernacular for that experience that I didn't have back then, but really it was during that time that I was playing dress-ups and clearly we all know as females and many males as well that dress-ups, you know, clothes and makeup and everything does kind of lift your mood, you know. But I really discovered that during the time that my dad died that when I would sort of play dress-ups, the clothing did so much, but when I put on a lipstick, I felt like a superhero, like it kind of, it was the change inside me that was so fascinating and it was a change I never forgot, you know, this sort of psychological, I guess, change inside. And then when I got to my teenage years, which were very awkward, you know, as they are for a lot of people, I mean, I was was very popular and socially adept and all that, but I'd felt awkward on the inside, you know, not being the beachy type, you know, not being kind of like the typical Australian look, you know. How would you describe how you looked as a teenager? (laughs) <laughs> pale and interesting I guess is it the words and I, pretty much like just like a younger version much younger version of how I look now like sort of had a vintage I would read Dolly and all those magazines and Cleo of course and mm. think I can't look like that and then I'd watch a black and white film you know a classic film and I think yeah but I could look like that you know and so it was kind of when I started to realize that I actually suited a different era of beauty, that it wasn't, that it's almost like I wanted to find a t-shirt saying I was considered beautiful in another era, (laughs) you know. That's interesting because the beachy Elle McPherson, you know, of the 80s when we were growing up, up, Mm -hmm. I wasn't that either, but I tried to be. I dyed my hair, I, you know, wore push-up bras, I tried to, I got tan. Yeah. But did you decide not to because that's a pretty brave choice to make I as did a decide girl. not to I did decide not to and you know I mean I clearly kind of knew that there would be things that I could do that would make me more conventionally beautiful get a tan fix my nose as you know there's what they say when someone has a, a stronger nose than conventional you know straighten my hair like and I did decide not to do those things and still to this day decide not to do those things which is, you know, not necessarily out of confidence so much, but it is out of the fact that I really believe that beauty is a human rights issue versus a vanity issue. What do you mean by that? Meaning that I think that we have a right to be beautiful in different ways, you know, versus being beautiful in a standardised way, you know, and I kind of have always tried to be the change that I want to see, which is that there isn't any standardised idea of what size a feature should be or what size a body should be for you to be considered beautiful, you know, so that it's really much more about a spirit. And also I think too getting women to understand that they can emulate different eras. You know, you don't have to emulate the era we're in in terms of beauty trends. If it doesn't suit you, if it doesn't suit your personality, if it doesn't suit your features, if it doesn't, that you can, you know, emulate other eras, you know. There's another era in the past that really Mm. feels much more like you. I remember when I first started university and I had my first gender studies lecture and I remember the lecturer talking about feminism and saying that 
if you're a feminist, you shouldn't wear lipstick. I think that's what she said. Maybe I probably misinterpreted it, but it was the, you know, late 80s, early 90s. So there was that school of thought around, right? Like the only way to be a feminist is to not conform to those beauty ideals. Or to not adorn yourself, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I've always known you to be a strong feminist. Absolutely. And there's the argument that women aspiring to beauty is self defeating because why are we validating us for how we look? Well, you know, first of all, I have to say most men don't like lipstick, you know, think about it, it's kind of a barrier. Yeah. <laughs> it sort of gets in the way of their plans, shall we say. <laughs> so, yeah. so I don't think lipstick is something that women wear to please men. I think lipstick is much more of a self-empowering move and much more of a move. It's almost like showing the world that you're all in. You're here. It's like, you know, if you're playing cards, you're all in. You've got lipstick on. You're ready. You're here. Even if it's a nude, it's just a, a move about being sort of finished and ready for the world, you know. And I think that kind of feminism is much more about your micro actions than it is about. I know a lot of women who are considered feminists in their macro actions, but then certainly What's in the, the difference? Corp- Explain what you mean by a micro action versus a micro, a macro action. How you really actually treat other women and about not rolling the rope ladder up behind you, you know, in terms of your own success of really being able, I mean, you are a shining example, I don't mean to sound sycophantic, but you are of kind of. (laughs) (laughs) But really, the action of actually being decent on a day-to-day basis to other women, when it's so easy to feel a scarcity of opportunity and kind of get competitive with other women, I think that that to me is a real sign of feminism, really being in your everyday actions, treating other women the way you would like to be treated rather than value flagging it and then in your actions, which I've seen a lot of people do. You know, it's interesting when you, you know, Instagram, you can see the difference between what people post and then knowing kind of like what they do. And there are certain female entrepreneurs who claim a lot of that stuff, but then I have found in their micro or daily actions are, are certainly not delivering. And so to me, feminism is a daily thing that you're doing every Mm. moment. It's like a practice rather than a label. Exactly. Up next, Poppy explains why she's so anti-social media and what's changed her mind. Also, what she's doing next, why her new business model is based on something entirely different. Plus, she talks about failure. You were talking before about the ideals of beauty and how when you're a teenager you didn't conform. Yeah. It's interesting now the way beauty in the last few years has become homogenized, led very much by the Kardashians, yep. by filters, by the mainstreaming of processes like lip fillers and cheek fillers. Oh, yeah, and, injectables. Know, injectables, and- exactly. How do you feel about all that? I feel like it's a little bit, you know, a tale of two cities, so to speak, you know, in the sense that I think there are the women and girls and certainly a lot of men now that are going to embrace that and then there are the people that aren't, you know, and I don't have any judgment. I certainly wonder how a lot of these people who do embrace all of that, like at what point they feel enough is enough or whether it really is something that in their soul is kind of making them feel better. And if it is, then great. But, you know, I've got no judgment on it. For me, it's something that I feel I would rather try to change my internal around, which is easier said than done, you know, Mm. Like, but change my internal rather than change my external because I feel like there's just so much more benefit in changing your internal. You know, your external I think is something that I notice that does seem to be very few people who once they start on that route that seem to be able to just kind of hold at a certain point. It does seem yeah, to Yeah, it's get, a slippery slope, isn't it's it? It's a real, I mean, and if you look at, you know, like I've been fascinated with the beauty impact of the housewives, you know, in the States. In the real housewives, the real yeah. Real housewives. So I've been watching it sort of research-wise for a long, long time and it's amazing when you see sort of like a new person come in and you just see them start 
to sort of just mould into because the others all have so much work done mm. just to look normal in comparison to the others. They start having so much work done. It and feels like an arm, arms race sometimes, doesn't it? Because yeah. it used to be that you didn't have to make so many choices around ageing or around your appearance. You yes. sort of worked with what you had. Basically you just tried to keep fit. Well, no, you you put lipstick on or you, yeah. you know, maybe dyed your hair, but that's pretty much all you could do yeah. unless you wanted to be extreme and have a facelift. But only like Hollywood stars and society ladies did that. Yeah. But now seemingly from the time you're 25, there are so many choices to be made because beauty is something that you can purchase. It and is, create. but I really don't feel there is any such thing as beauty without truth. And I'm not saying that you have to. The truth has to be harsh or can't be beautified. But I feel like once you start, the further you're moving away from the truth of yourself physically, I just don't call that beauty. I call that something else. You know, I call that maybe you're gaining confidence or you're mm. doing what you feel you need to do. But for me, you know, real beauty has truth to it. And so it's I, not perfect. It's not filtered. No, it's not homogenized. No, you know, and I think you can use the tools, you know, but I think it's what's so worrying about this current beauty environment is. Just that how, I don't know, I mean, I've made the choice following your lead, you know, not to use filters and stuff on Instagram, which for me as a beauty entrepreneur, I'm the only one. There's there's mm. not another single beauty entrepreneur that's not doing that. So when I look at my competition, I mean, it's all unbelievably mm. filtered. So I look incredibly different on every level as a beauty businesswoman in the Instagram and environment. And that's a choice too, isn't it? And Even deciding not to do that is a choice in itself. And because of what I was saying before, for me, I need truth and I operate in truth. And for me, the idea of making, I mean, I could make myself look so much better on Instagram than what I do. But when meeting someone in real life, you know, I'd much rather. Or looking in the mirror. Or looking in the mirror. I always wonder about that. Yeah, I always wonder too, like, like kind of how does that affect, you know, I'd much rather somebody say, oh, well, you know, your Instagram doesn't do you justice or something (laughs) than kind of like, oh, my God, you know. And and I'm really hoping that what I see, here's a prediction from the US, is I think that the Surgeon General, you know, so it's a bit like smoking in the 60s, you know, and, you know, people smoked in offices on planes. I mean, I remember going to New York in the 90s and people smoked on planes, you know. Do you want smoking or non-smoking? I mean, it just seems insane now to think of a big ball in the sky and smoking. You know, and if you think back to those sort of old-fashioned talk shows where you'd have a beautiful housewife smoking and saying how it relaxed her and all that kind of stuff, and then the Surgeon General started doing studies, you know, about what it was doing to your lungs and everything, and then there was obviously a whole awakening about what it was doing to you physically. And I think that's starting in the US, that the Surgeon General is starting to really do a lot of studies as to what social media is doing particularly for women's self-esteem we know it's destroying it's destroying it it's uh, destroying it and so I think that what's going to happen is I do think that ultimately it will become Mm. like smoking where kind of there are going to be people that stick to it and then there's going to be a mass exodus of people that just realize it's really 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 not helping them psychologically you know and I don't think we're there yet I really do believe there's going to be an exodus, you know, from the type of social media, Mm. you know, from the sort of narcissism slash insecurity because when I look at that now, what I really see – you know, is insecurity, you know, not. And it's interesting watching Celeste Barber with her reels, you know, that I find her so much more attractive and sexy when she's doing the spoof yeah. of, you know, like these girls yeah. that are so perfect and so serious and so, you know, kind of showing off their mm. their bodies and all that kind of stuff. I'm not a prude, but it just doesn't look sexy to me. It looks, mm. it looks robotic. And then when she does it, even in the spoof with her. Because she looks like she's having fun in her body, She looks like she's right? having fun, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so to me it's just kind of that's such an example of kind of like how you know, there's that kind of narcissistic selfie culture I think will really start to ease off because it's just not, Mm. no one's happy with it, not even the people doing it. especially not the people doing it. You once said something to me that I quote so much. Oh, I know what you're going to say. Yeah. You learn nothing about yourself 
from success. It just reaffirms what you already know. The true teacher is failure. And I think about that all the time. You and I have both had very public failures. Absolutely. Tell me about some of your failures and what they've taught you. Sure. You know, recently I've also started to realise because I'm really, really genuinely thinking about a book around this particular subject itself because it's something that I have thought about so much and have had the opportunity to really in a very real way experience. And I think that for me... I'm starting to really understand that there isn't really success or failure. That's something that people put on you from the outside, investors or the general public or the media or even your family, success or failure, when really it's success and failure because within anything that I look at that was publicly a success of mine, there were failures in it inherently, you know. And Give any me an example. Well, when I was at the top of sort of so-called top of my game, you know, I was in my 20s, had a multi-million dollar business. Young you know, Australian of the Year. Young Australian of the Year. Like I failed to understand when was the right time to raise money. You know, now I'm so seasoned at it, I understand that it seems oxymoronic, but that you have to raise money when you don't need it. You know, <laughs> that's when you, as an entrepreneur, you go out for certainly for consumer goods brands. You have to raise money when you don't need it. I'm very polite. I don't want to take money if I don't need it. So I waited until I needed it. And that was a big quote unquote failure in terms of the business because by the time I needed to find investors, that then limited who could come in. It was a whole kind of, there was a whole chain reaction for having failed to understand that my problem was timing and Mm. that that when I least needed to raise money was when I needed to start Because that's when you've got the power. Exactly. Mm. That's when you've got the power. And so I had a very successful business, but I had a failure of sort of understanding in terms of timing there. And then when I look at what's quote unquote called the failures, when the business did ultimately end up in receivership, it didn't go bankrupt, which is what is often called, but it's a difference and it's an important difference. It ended up in receivership, meaning that there was an impasse at the board level and so the only option I had was to put it up for sales and that's receivership, and it's, which is like rolling the dice and seeing mm-hmm. who, who comes f- and helps basically or who's interested to buy. So that was sort of the quote-unquote big failure was that my business went into receivership. But I know for me, gosh, I'm going to get teary, you know, the incredible success personally of getting through that, you know, and the integrity of the decisions that I made. Sorry, (laughs) menopause. (laughs) And the integrity of the decisions that I made. And I personally know that at the time when I was being reported as a failure that I was so successful in terms of my own personal management and integrity. You've just given me something new to think. Do you need a tissue? (laughs) Something new to think about the failure in the success and the success in the failure. Yes, I've been up close and behind the scenes of major, you know, and really in the C-suite of so many bastions of American brands. I mean, I'm probably one of the only Australians that's actually seen this much behind the curtain in so many brands in consumer goods in, in America. I can tell you that Anything that they do that looks like a success, there's massive failures involved and anything that they do that looks like a failure, there's successes too. It's not. The two are totally codependent. There's no way of having Mm. one or the other. There's a way of, of it appearing one or the other. So it's not just something that I'm talking about just as a personal observation. I'm talking about it as a worldwide observation that it's one of the last terms so many terms that are binary are being reassessed, you know, but one of the last terms to be reassessed and to move out of a binary idea is, is that success and failure. Is success and failure. There's been like a a trend, trend's probably the wrong word, but for women, particularly female entrepreneurs or successful women in any field, to need to lead with their failures. You know, to need to be very upfront about talking about their failures. Mia Culpa. Mia Culpa wrote a book called (laughs) Mia Culpa. She has a book called How to Fail. I've done the same thing where I'm very public about my failures. You do the same thing too. There aren't a lot of men who are really successful who talk about their failures or who are expected to talk about their failures. Why do you think that we do it? 
I think that it's a sociological thing. You know, women are expected to be nurturers and men are expected to conquest, you know. And I think that, you know, women in business and on female entrepreneurs, they do, you know, tend to have a more nurturing approach to the next generation or to the public around their business and feel more responsibility for some kind of, you know, personal development to be part of their business. And whereas I think men, you know, on the whole is conquest, you mm. know. So don't it's, let don't show any vulnerability. Don't show any vulnerability. It's but about why, we show vulnerability. Why? Because it's like a self defense mechanism, like we have to cut our ourselves down before someone else cuts us down? I think it's about sort of being female, you know, you're not considered female if you Mm. don't show that vulnerability. And also, you know, as you said, I think it's just expected of women to kind of fess up to their mistakes but with men it's expected for them to be covered up and Mm. but obviously you know I think all of that is changing as well you know because I think that the male idea of business which is what I call an MBA is male business accepted practices that's an MBA I think are really proving to be very flawed in terms of short term and you know I for one am somebody that am hoping in my elder years to really advocate against quarterly reporting because I believe that quarterly reporting, which means reporting your your profits every quarter, Mm -hmm. drives a kind of male idea of business where where you've got to prove something every three months that I think that if that were not on companies, you would have much less waste and much more time to let good ideas develop. I've heard you talk about the fact in the beauty industry that that often leads to companies making products that no one really wants, but they need that sugar hit growth. Can you explain how that works? Sure. So basically what you've got is like if you're reporting every quarter, even if you're not, but you're being compared to every quarter, you know, you've got to show growth. And the way to show growth is to put new product out. And instead of relying on repeat business, you've got to sort of push new product out. So it's a supply driven model where you push the supply and you you get a hit, you know, you get a Mm. little bit of a sugar spike from that, but it's not really from organic demand or So in your case, I know that there've been times, I think in Poppy Industries and then with Lipstick Queen, where your backers or your board have pushed you to do products other than lipstick. Yes. Is that an example of that? That's definitely. How did that go? That's definitely. I mean, there are certain products that, you know, I would do other than lipstick. I've got some products in mind. But it was more about the idea of pushing to do a full range of cosmetics versus pushing to do products to me that were meaningful Mm. around the lipstick. It was about just filling, ticking the categories. We needed this, we needed that. We need a brow pencil, we we need need mascara, we need why don't we do skincare. So it's, uh, you know, whereas I'll only bring out something if there's a real point of view to it. And, you know, I've always been somebody, and I guess this is kind of like, you know, I often wonder why I've had so much interest from US corporations in my consulting when you think that, you know, what do I know that they don't? But, you know, and I think it's because I've always been somebody that's very, very interested in the narrative. So I can give things a very big story but I don't there doesn't have to be much product where I think a lot of companies in beauty they have a lot of product and not much story so Mm. you've got all this product that comes out there's a tiny little bit of story it's a collaboration and that's it or it's this or it's that and then they move on to the next and there's just all this kind of wastage of just supply driven Mm. product that doesn't really have a narrative and so often I get called into these places to say you know can you help us with the narrative here? And, you know, sometimes they don't like what I have to say. So it's been both my strength and I guess also my weakness is that I'm a narrative driven, not product driven. Mm. Just finally, tell me about your life now. What's it like? Well, my life now is, well, right at the moment, it's kind of like <laughs> Freaky Friday. It's kind of, but, you know, because I'm in Australia, it feels like um, my life is like how it was 30 years ago. My life is very, 
very focused on my entrepreneurship, you know, I have to say, really, I chose not to have children, you know, and that was a choice that I made in my 30s. I really thought about it and thought it really took into account what energy levels I had and what I thought I could do well and sort of what on my deathbed, so to speak, would I really feel that I wanted to have tried. And I guess for me, I've really wanted to use my life as an experiment of being a totally self-made female, you know, and I don't mean that necessarily financially. I mean that on every level, like independent of kind of a domestic situation, you know. That's Um, interesting. I've never heard that articulated like that before. So when you were looking at it, what about having kids? It's funny because people with kids can get very defensive and be like, does my life look so shit to you? Like, No, not at all. Uh, That's not what I think. But what is it about having children that you thought – would be incompatible. With I just what don't you think wanted. I could do it well at doing them both. But no know. one does it that well. <laughs> and well, you know, I grew up with a single mother. You know, I saw what it's like. So I, for you, it would have been a case of doing it as a single woman. M- well, I would have most likely because you know I'm a female that's much happier being single than being in a bad relationship. Oh, yes. There's a wonderful Mae West quote where she says, well, I may only choose bad men, but that's only because I've got men to choose from. (laughs) And I don't mean to sound like a skip, but I think there are a lot of compromises that men have expected me to make once I'm in a relationship with them. Just in terms of my priorities, I think the biggest compromise when they see my competency at manifesting things, at making businesses, that they want me to sort of take my skill base and sort of help them with what they're trying to do, which is actually do it for them. And I've found that that's a compromise I have often been asked in relationships is that that my skills sort of shift over to their priorities versus mine. And And have you tried that? Or you've just always been clear about not interested? I had an unusual experience because the the main relationship that I had in the US 10 years was with a much younger man, which I never, ever anticipated. How much Um, younger? A lot younger. (laughs) I'm I'm not giving. (laughs) I certainly didn't know when when he first started asking me out. I I thought he was 10 years younger, but he wasn't. He was um, more than 10 years younger. Yes, mm-hmm. yeah. This is when I was 40. I met him when I was 40 and and very, very, very sophisticated. And there's something about, you know, a younger man who is pursuing an older woman that they have no fear, you know, in a way that maybe somebody your own age has, you know. So he was extremely persistent. And Was um, the fact that you didn't want to have kids appealing to him or was that no no he wanted no he wanted to at a certain point you know so for me that was a very very formative relationship for both of us and I think that that one was definitely a case you know for anybody listening who's ever had a relationship with somebody younger and not by design like not looking for that but that just is Mm. the relationship that sort of comes to the surface as the most sort of compelling one. It was very confusing in terms of, you know, there are certain things that when somebody's a different age Mm. that you kind of separate out and think, oh, that's to do with their age. And I think that was definitely a case where the compromise was, you know, can I sort of train him to be me and move my kind Mm. of priorities to him? But, you know, and I've had many other relationships in the States. I've almost gotten married a couple of times and decided not to. Why? Again, it's just not something that I think I'd be particularly good at. (laughs) Have you ever lived with someone? Yes, I have. How do you find that? I find that okay. You know, it depends on the person. It's just more that I just find often what in heteronormative relationships I just don't really quite fit the idea of what the Mm. priorities should be. Mm. And so I have a feeling that, you know, I'd be somebody that might get married in my 60s or something like that. I feel I've always sort of been an outlier and done things sort of the opposite way around, you know. So it's not that I'm close to it. Like Gloria Steinem. Yeah, it's not that I'm close to it. It's Mm. just that I won't compromise on reaching my own potential. And if something is going to interfere with that, that sort of self-actualization. And for me, I know that I just don't have I wouldn't have the energy to, I mean, I admire so much people like yourself who who have children and a relationship. For me, I find that, you know, really 
pioneering different business models. It takes all my energy. When I see Poppy, it's like seeing an old school friend because I think that was the age we were pretty much. We were both about 19 when we met and we were both at similar points in our careers where we were really enthusiastic, didn't really have a clue about what we were doing, but really, really loved doing it. And I watched her star shine really, really brightly, really fast. I saw the toll it took on her when things went bad. And I literally saw the tall poppy effect take place. I watched her be decimated in the media at a time when there weren't other female entrepreneurs. And so when I started Mamma Mia, Poppy was really a role model for me because she was one of my very few references for the fact that a woman could start her own business. I hope you enjoyed that. Go buy a Poppy lipstick. We'll put a link in the show notes. Original Sin is the bomb. It's like this kind of shimmery red. I don't know why it's so flattering. That's her genius. The executive producer of No Filter is Kimberly Bradish with sound production by Maddie Joanu. I'm Mia Friedman and thank you for having me in your ears. It's a privilege. <laughs>